Good evening and uh, welcome on behalf of the University of California Observatories. I welcome you to the Lick Observatory. I'm John Wareham. I'm the Deputy Director. And uh, you're at a research facility that's been leading observational astronomy for almost 125 years. Tonight you'll have the opportunity to look through the 36-inch Great Lick Refractor and also our 40-inch Nickel Reflector on the other end of the building. And don't forget we've got five or six amateur telescopes set up in back here. And while you're waiting to see one of the major telescopes, be sure and stop by the amateur telescopes. They're, they're terrific, and our volunteers come and provide those for us. You received a couple numbers when you came in tonight, one for the 36-inch and one for the 40-inch telescope. Uh, where those numbers are consecutively will determine which group of 10 you go in when you arrive at that telescope. So the, lower, the, the, the lowest 10 numbers that are at the telescope ready to enter at any given time will be the group of 10 that go in. We won't break your groups up. We can fudge you know, a few numbers one way or the other on that. The gift shop will be open until 10.30 tonight, so be sure and stop by there and take a little bit of lick back with you. If any of you need special assistance, please let us know, and we will accommodate you in our telescopes. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, Dr. Sandra Faber. Dr. Faber is a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and an astronomer at the University of California Observatories. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Her current research is focused on the formation and evolution of galaxies. She was the principal investigator for the just completed Deep 2 survey of 50,000 distant galaxies using the DEMOS spectrograph at the Keck 2 telescope in Hawaii, which is also managed by the University of California Observatories. The survey became part of a database that provides unique material for studying every aspect of galaxy evolution. Dr. Sandra Faber. Thank you, John. Uh, as you can tell, I care about galaxies, and so I'm going to tell you a lot about them this evening. Let me, before I plunge in here, I, I have to confess, first of all, that this talk is still in its infant stages. It takes me several times to give a talk before it really gets smoothed out. This is only the second time that I've given this talk, so it's rather new. And it's a bit of an experiment. It's not quite your average astronomy talk. The first part is, in the first part, which will last about 20 or 25 minutes, I'm going to review our cosmic history here on Earth. Essentially, I'm going to try to summarize 14 billion years of events in about 20 or 25 minutes. And I'm going to start at the Big Bang, and I'm going to talk about the formation of our Milky Way, galaxies in general, our galaxy, our sun, stars, planets within galaxies, and basically, these are, I like to think of it as the first three chapters in our book of origins. And after that, we have to turn things over to the geophysicists to tell us how Earth formed and evolved. And finally, we have to talk to the biologists. And then maybe on the last page, we talk to the historians. But most of this book is covered by science. And one of the morals of this first part of my talk is you will be amazed, if you haven't been following this subject, how well we understand the first 14 billion years. And I'm going to build on that result. If you understand the past, then you should be able to predict the future. And that's the second part of my talk. There's a lot of wisdom in that understanding of the first 14 billion years. And I'm going to try to draw some nuggets of realization in from it and get you to think about the challenges that face humanity, because the result of all of this is that we know where we came from, where we're situated, what our problems and situations are, cosmically speaking. How can we now plan for the future? So let's describe what the future would look like cosmically and how we have to change our behavior in order to capitalize on it. All right, so enough of a general introduction. Let's, let's get started. The formation of our Milky Way galaxy is a key milestone in our history. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about what a galaxy is. Most galaxies around us are so-called spiral galaxies, and they are flattened, rotating pinwheels of stars. You can think of them as sort of like rotating frisbees. 
How do we know this? We know this because we can see what look like basically similar objects at different, at different inclinations, orientations to us. So here is a spiral galaxy seen face on. Spiral galaxies are flattened rotating pinwheels of stars. Sometimes we see them, they're basically circular. Sometimes we see them looking round and face on. Sometimes we see them edge on. And this is what they look like when they're edge on. And this is very interesting. Uh, in this case, often when they're edge on, you can see this dark band across their middles. And that's because there's material between the stars, dust mixed with interstellar gas. The stars form out of the gas, and in the, the gas is, are these dust grains. They're about the size of cigarette smoke. Tiny, tiny particles, less smaller than the wavelength of light. And each one individually is negligible, but when you have so many of them over long sight lines, they actually absorb the light of stars and they can show up in silhouettes. Now, I want you to remember this dust because it turns out that it's a crucial part of our history, of our personal human history. So remember that galaxies have these little dust grains in, mixed up with their interstellar gas. Now, I want to persuade you that we're basically in a galaxy like this. How do I do that? By appealing to wide field photographs taken from the surface of the Earth looking up at the sky. This is a picture taken at a star party in the Sierras with somebody's amateur telescope. Amateurs take wonderful photographs. And uh, this is looking at the center of our galaxy. And you can get an even better impression of the galaxy by putting several of those pictures together. And when you do that, well, before you do that, if you enlarge this, you can see that this area here, which looks rather smooth in this picture, when you enlarge it, breaks up into little grains of sand. So each one of those is a star. So when we look at pictures of galaxies and they look smooth, they aren't really. If we could fly up to the galaxies and fly through them, we'd find that they're mostly empty. It's only the fact that our ground-based telescopes can't make infinitely sharp pictures, and so the, the images of the stars become blurry and overlap and make a structure like this that looks smooth. That's not smooth. It's just a lot of stars. Now, as I said, we can put pictures like that together. This is the picture we've been looking at here. And then we can move our telescope and aim here and aim here. And we can aim all across the sky. And we see this thing that we call the Milky Way, which is in a great circle extending 360 degrees around the sky. And the reason for that is that we're in the plane of our galaxy. We're sitting in the plane of the Frisbee. And we can draw a good parallel now between the structure of our galaxy. Here's the dust in our galaxy. Here's the dust in that other object. This one happens to be a little bit more flattened and regular than we are. We're a little bit more disorganized. But you see the parallel immediately. And if we were to locate a cross showing approximately where we locate in our Milky Way, we'd be about here. We're not in the urban center, and we're not in the boondocks. We're somewhere in the suburbs of our Milky Way. OK, so to give you an even better mental image of what our region of space looks like, let's look at this fabulous movie, which was made by a friend of mine at the University of Hawaii. And his name is Brent Tully. And together with Joel Premack, my colleague at Santa Cruz, the two of them made this movie for a NOVA program. And this is a fly through our galaxy and then out of our galaxy into intergalactic space. And it starts by flying towards this very familiar constellation here. This is Orion. This is the belt of Orion, the shoulders, the knees, and this is the, the sword of Orion hanging below the belt. So let's start the video. OK. And in the beginning, the stars are all in the right place. As we get farther away, he has to fake it more and more. But um, up to this point, it's still pretty accurate. And the first thing you've noticed is that Orion has disappeared. It's not a real grouping of stars. It's a chance alignment. Now we're flying into the sword, and we can see that that's not a star. It's a glowing cloud of gas. 
And here is another glowing cloud of gas. We're going to say more about these glowing gas clouds. They are places where stars are being born. They are places where the gas density is high. Stars form there for that reason. And the newly formed, very, very bright stars excite the gas around them, causing it to glow. So when you see a glowing region like that, it's called an H2 region, they're stellar nurseries. So now we continue to fly through our galaxy. And here's another glowing cloud of gas. But this one's completely different. This is a dying star. This is an expanding cloud of gas that's been blown up in a supernova explosion in the year 1054. It was recorded by the Chinese. It's called the Crab Nebula. So we've seen stars being born, and we've seen an example of the death of a star. That gets us to think in terms of a life cycle going on inside these galaxies. That's part of our story. So now, this is perhaps the most marvelous mo moment in this movie, in which the makers were really clever and morphed our galaxy into the image of another real galaxy, which we think we're very similar to. And here are the Magellanic Clouds. They're disappearing out of sight. We have some companions around us. And now our, our uh, frame of reference is swinging around to the other end of the local group. And we're going to fly through this particular object, which has a cloud of stars forming right here. That's in one of those H2 regions. This is our big neighbor in space, Andromeda, another galaxy like us, two million light years away. We don't linger, though. And now we're flying out of our local group past a lot of nearby galaxies that are really familiar to amateurs because they look great in everybody's telescopes, even small ones. So this is M101. This is the Whirlpool Nebula where spiral structure was discovered by Lord Ross over 150 years ago. And now we see other galaxies in the universe. And you get some sense for how they're distributed and how big they are. Their, their sizes and, and locations are faithful. Tully knew, mapped this region of space, so he was able to put these in. And every picture is the actual image of the galaxy taken with a ground-based telescope, put in in the right location and the right size. And what we've seen is, in this image, is that they're not uniformly distributed. They're in filaments, and the filaments intersect in big clusters. This is our nearest big cluster, a thousand galaxies, the Virgo cluster, a huge galaxy at the center with a three billion solar mass black hole. The movie ends, fortunately. Okay. Hmm? Somebody said something? Why don't you hold the question, okay? Yeah, I'm going to answer lots of questions at the end. Okay. So, a great movie, and now you have, I hope, a much better mental image of how things are distributed in space. And let me just say that uh, this, image, this movie was true, it was faithful, except that everybody was, everybody, every object was made brighter so that you could see it with your naked eye. To make things look this bright takes long exposures in big telescopes. So, if you were out there in intergalactic space looking around, you'd hardly see anything little very faint smudges. The galaxies have been jacked up so that you can see them. Okay, now I promised to give you a history so obviously I have to explain where galaxies come from. And we even understand this even though the roots of this began 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. That's an incredibly tiny length of time. 10 to the minus 35 seconds. Put a 1 draw a horizontal line and put a one with 35 zeros at, uh, after it in the denominator. That's how small a part of a second I am talking about. At that time, something very interesting and unusual happened, and you'll have to ask me about that in the question period. But the, the, the result of that very early and unusual period was to impress upon the universe small density ripples. So take those for granted. What happens as the universe expands? Well, let's focus on a place where there's a little bit more density. This, this is the density of matter, and it's generating gravity. So the universe is expanding. Every patch is expanding. Around this peak, things get retarded because there's a little bit of extra matter there. So the, the expansion slows down, and that means that this area gets overdense compared to an average region. By the same token, 
a valley of density loses its material and it falls onto the neighboring peaks. This is called a gravitational instability. And uh, we have sort of a familiar example closer to home in the field of economics. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And exactly in that way, tiny little infinitesimal ripples in the density pattern of the early universe grow and get magnified over time. And lumps form, and then lumps fall together to make bigger lumps in a process of hierarchical clustering. Okay, so now that was a lot of words. It's much easier to get the idea by looking at a movie. So let's look at this movie, which comes from 1992. It's a very primitive movie when people just began to make movies like this. This is a computer simulation. This is a sphere, which is supposed to be a normal little patch of the universe, very typical. They put the simulators put the density ripples in. They made the sphere expand outwards, and then they computed how every particle in the sphere pulled gravitationally on every other. And you'll see then how this instability works. So you can see that this is not quite uniform here. Very primitive video rendering that uh, doesn't sh really show you very clearly exactly what the ripples are, but you can see that it's not exactly uniform. So let's start this going. Okay, so the sphere expands. And what looked like was very uniform, just after a few expansion times, has broken up into little blobs. So every one of those blobs there it was a peak and it grew by grow, drawing the material in around it. Now, I urge you, or I suggest, that you, you pick two of your favorite blobs, like maybe those, and just watch them coalesce as the expansion continues, okay? This is what I meant by the hierarchical clustering thing. Okay, we make blobs and then they fall together to make bigger blobs. And it, it turns out that this kind of pattern could either be a cluster of galaxies forming, every one of these could be a galaxy, or equally well, it could be pieces of a galaxy. This whole thing could be our Milky Way. It's almost, uh, if you're familiar with the concept, it's, it's like a fractal. Okay. The, the, the nature of the pattern is the same from small scales to large. And all of this just comes out of the mathematics of gravity. Okay, so now let's look at a modern version of this. This is an attempt to simulate our own galaxy. And this was a simulation with many billions of particles in it, representing the forefront of what people are able to compute today. And it's made by colleagues of mine at UC Santa Cruz a few years ago. So here we're starting pretty early before the lumps had developed very much. And again, I'm telling you, this is our Milky Way. So this is the, going to be the center of the Milky Way. This is going to be the outer parts of the Milky Way. Okay, this is the Milky Way at early times. And now at high resolution, we have a much greater appear, uh, appreciation for the, the formation of these filaments and how the filaments, here's a filament here, okay, there's a filament there and so on. This is the center of our galaxy building up. And it's forming as a result of globbling up tens of thousands of these small satellite galaxies. And where are we in this picture? Well, this is modeling the entire scale of the Milky Way, which is very big. In this picture, we are sort of here, okay? And so the disk of our galaxy in a picture would be something like that. Okay, now, you're probably at this point unbelievably puzzled because you're saying, our galaxy doesn't look like that in pictures. You showed me, Sandy, a bunch of pictures of galaxies, and I didn't see all those things around them. I saw one big galaxy, maybe with a few neighbors. That's because I pulled a fast one on you. Okay, what is shown in these movies thus far is something called the dark matter. Six-sevenths of all the matter in the universe is mysterious stuff, maybe some kind of unusual new elementary particle with different physics from the ordinary matter in this, in this room. Okay, this is, I call this ordinary matter. This is the matter of the periodic table. You know, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, iron, silicon, etc. Okay, that's ordinary stuff. That's what we're made out of. Dark matter is something completely different, some brand new particle, and actually most of the mass in the universe consists of dark matter. 
Dark matter is well named. It's invisible. It doesn't emit light. And it doesn't show up in our telescopes. So you can't take a picture of a galaxy and see its dark matter structure. Dark matters are mixtures of ordinary matter, which makes a disk in the inner part. And that makes stars, and we can see that in our telescopes, but the dark matter is invisible. And you're probably asking me, well, gosh, Sandy, how do you know it's there? How can you be so confident if you can't see it in a, in a picture? The answer is that it develops gravity. We know it's there because it pulls on other things, and we deduce its properties from that. That's been a long story, been one of the greatest achievements of cosmology in the last 20 years, discovering the dark matter. Okay, so uh, you're, you're saying, well, that's all very well, uh, but convince me by showing me a movie of how the visible part of a galaxy might form. Well, I brought such a movie. This next movie is another movie made by some Japanese astronomers, and in this movie, there's dark matter with gravity doing its pulling and pushing the way dark matter does, but the dark matter is invisible and it's not shown in the movie. Instead, they put ordinary matter into the process and let it make stars, settle into galaxies and form stars. And what you see here is the ordinary matter, which is the stars and the gas. Good, okay? So in the beginning, there's dark matter and gas. Gas is hydrogen and helium coming out of the Big Bang. And the gas is these diffuse blue clouds here. The dark matter halos are forming. There's a big dark matter halo here drawing gas into it. Here are the filaments. The gas collapses into the filaments and drains along the filaments into the middle. And that's where we get big galaxies and big clusters of galaxies later. So the gas is, is settling in and it's, as I said, a hierarchical clustering process. You make something, you make another blob, and they fall together. So in the early days, these proto-galaxies are constantly interfering with one another. They're very disturbed looking because they keep running into one another. The universe is small and dense. And every time they, they collide with one another, the stars that were in a rotating disk get flung out by the perturbation of gravity. And so gradually we develop bigger and bigger galaxies that are surrounded by clouds of stars, halos of stars. And any leftover gas resettles into a nice rotating disk. So this is a constant process of disturbance and resettling every time things are messed up by a collision. And here's now what the process looks like towards the end of time. Here's where we are now in the lifetime of our galaxy. This is the center where the stellar density is very high. We're surrounded by a big halo of stars. We see that in our galaxy. And we have a plane, a, a plane of, of gas left. If, and it's un, if it's undisturbed, it will be forming stars over time. Okay. So this is a simulation which actually looks pretty much like reality. So it's pretty clear from simulations like this that we're on the right track, but we'd like even more evidence to back it up. And fortunately, we can get that by using a big telescope like the Hubble telescope to look back in time. So the Hubble took an ultra deep field picture. It's an exposure that lasted for two weeks. It's probably the most expensive picture ever taken by humankind. It's about a $20 million picture. And Here's the region of sky that it covered compared to the moon. It's about a tenth or so the size of the, of the full moon. And it's an absolutely typical patch of sky. On average, every patch of sky looks like that if photographed this way. And this is what it looks like. There are about 10,000 objects in that little patch. And every one of these, with the exception of a handful, that's a nearby star in our galaxy. Uh, but every other, and that's another nearby star, but just about everything else you see here is a distant galaxy. And now the challenge is, from a picture like this, it's hard to tell which ones are close by and which ones are far away. But fortunately, we actually have tools for telling how far away that object is and how far away that object is. So I said a moment ago that we're looking back in time. 
with a big telescope, when we see far out into space, what, what's happening is that um, we're, it's taking more and more time for the light of the objects to actually get to us. So, you know, when we look at the sun, we look eight minutes back in time. If we look at Jupiter, it's 40 minutes. If we look at the nearest star, it's four light years. The Andromeda Nebula is two million years. But these objects here are billions, some of them billions and billions of years away. And that's taking advantage of the light, the finite light travel time, speed of light. This is very good because we can actually look into the past. If we look at farther objects, we're seeing slices of the universe as it actually existed earlier in time. So astronomers like myself are now compiling histories of the universe by slicing and distance. And we're putting together, we're piecing together the evolutionary history of galaxies. Okay, so with that kind of information, we can make a movie. This is a cool movie. It's approximate, but people have now estimated the distance of every one of those galaxies that you see in the picture, and they've strung them out along the line of sight. So we're going to fly down this line of sight out into space and back in time simultaneously. So let's do that. Okay. Okay, we're starting to fly. And the first things that we're flying past are pretty bright, okay, and big. And that's because they're close to us. That means they're close in time to us. That means they're fairly old, the way we are. We're 14 billion years old. As we keep flying, we're flying to earlier times. The galaxies are getting smaller, and they're also getting more and more ragged and less orderly looking. And we can understand that because... These are slices of the universe in which the early galaxies were more disturbed. Very disturbed here, right? Okay. And now finally, we get to a point in the picture where there are no more galaxies. And that's because Hubble is actually able to look to times that are so early that any galaxies that have formed there are too faint, maybe don't exist, but at any rate are too faint to be seen by our telescopes. So this is a t period of time in the universe. There was the Big Bang. The universe expanded. The ripples grew. But there was a time before galaxies actually began to mature. We call those the Dark Ages. And that lasted for oh, several hundred million years after the Big Bang. And then the galaxies began to turn on. Stars began to form. And the universe began to light up with starlight in galaxies. So just reminding you, the total age of the universe is about 14 billion years old. All right, so that's the story of galaxy formation. But obviously now we have to look at our Milky Way and we have to figure out what went on inside our Milky Way that led to us. So that's the next chapter in the history. And let's start by looking at our neighbor in space here, this galaxy that is one member of the local group. We flew through it before and we flew right through that particular patch. And Hubble has taken a picture of that patch. This is what that patch looks like with high-resolution Hubble telescope. And it shows the characteristic cloud of newly formed stars. And they put out a lot of very energetic light. Each one of these stars is about a million times brighter than our sun. And very energetic. They're exciting the gas around them and causing it to light up and glow. So here is a huge stellar nursery in this nearby object. Why is this happening? This is happening because there's a lot of gas in this galaxy between the stars. And if you have a region where the gas density is high, it can fall together by its own self-gravity and create these stars. So it's gravity again, but inside a galaxy making stars. We have many examples of this. And they make some of the most beautiful pictures taken by Hubble. This is called the Jewel Box. Here's a new group of stars. Cause, uh, causing its, its associated gas cloud to glow. Here's another particularly lovely example. A new group of stars sending out an intense rain of photons and actually sculpting pillars of gas, much the way rain sculpts pillars of gas in the Bryce Canyon. Okay, now, in one particular region, it happens to be the closest to us, 
Remember the sword in Orion? It's quite close to us, and we can study it in detail with Hubble, and we've seen some amazing things when we've done that. So let's blow that up and look at the Hubble montage of the sword of Orion blowing it up even more in the heart of the Orion Nebula. And at this magnification, we begin to see that there are some strange little objects in there, aren't there? Okay, But we're not done. Make it even bigger. Okay, And now they really begin to show up and have some structure to them. So there are about 50 of these all together in Orion. Some look sort of cometary, and others look like this. These are the young ones that have just formed, and these are the older ones. These are proto-planetary systems forming around stars that are condensing within the solar nebula, within the Orion nebula. And when a star forms, most of the material goes into the star, but a disk of gas forms around it. And remember that dust that we were talking about at the beginning? There's dust mixed with the gas, and when it settles into a disk, it makes the disk opaque. And when we see that whole structure against a background, we see it silhouetted. And so this is what our sun and solar system looked like when they first began to form. These things here are just a few million years old. So again, one of the reasons we can understand them is we see examples at different orientations. Here's, it happens, it happens that there's one that's really nearly edge on. Here is the light of its star peeping out above and below the disk of, of uh, dust and gas. And the total size of this is about 17 times bigger than Pluto's orbit. In other words, it's about the size of the cloud of comets that comprise our own solar system. So by studying the properties of systems like this and objects like them, we are In addition to understanding how galaxies form, we're now able to understand how stars and solar systems and planets are forming inside the galaxies. So simulations are just starting to to mimic, mimic this process. They're not as far along as the simulations of galaxy formation, but they're getting there. This is a sort of an artist's conception. And what happens in this disk of rotating dust and gas, the dust particles, the interstellar dust, begin to stick together, and that's what makes asteroids. And asteroids collide with other bodies to make the middles of rocky planets. This is how Jupiter started. It has a rocky planet in its middle. And we are, of course, a rocky planet. So this is, this is the, the essential unity I want you to understand. When we look out and see dust clouds in our own and other galaxies, we are seeing the material of planets. This is what makes planets form. Okay, so it's been very surprising to find other planets. With techniques that were pioneered here at Lick Observatory, we now know that there exist over 500 planets around nearby stars, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're only finding... uh, the bigger ones. And one of the things that has really surprised us about the discovery of these other solar systems is the existence of Jupiter-like planets very close to their parent stars. In our own solar system, Jupiter is out there beyond the orbit of Earth, five Earth orbital radii away from the sun. All the big planets are in the outer part of the solar system. That is not true in these solar systems that we're, that we're finding around other stars. They have different geometries. Another difference, in our solar system, everybody goes pretty much in a circle, and that's a very good thing. It means that Jupiter doesn't come close to the Earth. If it did, the gravity of Jupiter would perturb our orbit and perhaps fling us into outer space. In other solar systems that we're discovering, the orbits are very elongated and the planets can cross, their orbits can cross, they're very unstable. It seems as though we were extremely lucky to have the geometry that we have and perhaps even very rare. Okay, so now here's, here's where the status stands of the discovery of other solar systems. This is a good diagram to show this. So. Along this axis is a planet's mass in units of the Earth's mass. 
So one Earth mass is going to be here. This is the Earth. And along this axis is the distance of the planet from its sun in units of Earth distance. So Earth, which has one Earth mass and is one astronomical unit away from the sun, is at 1, 1 in this diagram. Here are the rest of the planets in our solar system, Venus, Earth, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, if you want to call it a planet. And compared to our solar system is a selection of 160 planets that have been found using the so-called Doppler method, which looks at wobbles in planetary radial velocities from us. And you can see that the Doppler method, let me go back here, okay? The Doppler method is easy to use, but it sort of just misses being able to see planets in our own solar system. And it's, it's quite far, it's almost a factor of 100 away from being able to detect small planets like Venus and Earth. So fortunately, though, there are other methods for finding planets that are now coming into use. There's a satellite called Kepler, which can actually detect planets by seeing them pass in front of their parent stars. And when that happens, the light of the star is dimmed. And we can just barely detect Earth-like planets with Kepler. And we're going to get lots of announcements of many Earth-like planets that have been detected soon by Kepler. It's in the process of publishing results. And then there's another technique called gravitational lensing that can find planets out here. So we're going to know a lot more about planets around other solar systems soon. We know they're there, though, that's for sure. All right, so now we've got planets that have formed. That's chapter two, stars and planets. Uh, and now, though, I, I need to justify the interstellar dust. We needed the dust in order to get rocks. And we needed rocks in order to get rocky planets like the Earth. So where does the interstellar dust come from? Well, dust is an example of what we call in astronomy heavy elements. Remember that periodic table up on the, the wall in chemistry? There was hydrogen and helium, and then there was all the other stuff. Okay, All the other stuff are heavy elements. Coming out of the Big Bang, Everything is virtually just hydrogen and helium. And something had to make all that heavy stuff. And the interstellar dust, and not to mention uranium, thorium, lead, iron, etc., okay, all of that stuff had to be made somehow in a separate process. And it came from stars. Here is a diagram to show patterns of stars. And massive stars are luminous at the top of the diagram. Stars shine by taking hydrogen and helium and putting them together to make these heavier elements. So, for example, I can take hydrogen, combine it to make helium. I can add some helium together and make carbon. I can take a carbon and a, and a helium and put it together to make an oxygen and so on. That's the way stars get energy to shine. It's called nuclear fusion. It's a hydrogen bomb, essentially. Okay, so that wouldn't do us any good if the stars simply kept all their material when they die. But fortunately, they're generous with it, and they send it out to outer space when they explode. Here's my primitive simulation of a supernova. Okay. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do with PowerPoint. Okay, so the supernova went off, and then a thousand years later, here's a picture of the Crab Nebula. Remember, we flew past the Crab Nebula in the movie. That was an exploding star. And the guts of this star has, have been thrown into outer space. And there's a huge amount of oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and other stuff that were cooked in that star and are now going out into the gas between the stars and now are now available to be incorporated in the next generation of solar systems. Okay, And it's this heavy stuff that condenses in the atmospheres of stars to make the dust. So this whole thing is cosmic recycling. Here we have a galaxy and a supernova going off in it. You can see how bright a supernova is when it explodes. It's almost as bright as the whole parent galaxy. Ejecta come out full of heavy elements, get mixed with interstellar gas, out of which a new generation of stars form. New stars form. Some of them explode as supernova, and the process just 
repeats. And with every round through this cycle, the interstellar gas is building up constantly in its abundance of heavy elements. And we think that there's a threshold value you have to get to before you can actually start forming planets. So there's a lag in galaxy history between early galaxy, which doesn't have enough heavy elements, then later in its lifetime, it starts making planets. So I'm nearing the end of the astronomy part of my talk. Let's recapitulate. 14 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang. And very soon after the Big Bang, the first galaxies began to form and made the first generation of early galactic stars. Hierarchical clustering brought galaxies together. They grew in size. And after about 10 billion years, the disk of our galaxy began to settle. These collisions slowed down, and we wound up with a mature Milky Way. A little bit more time needed to go on while the abundance of heavy elements still increased, another 5 billion years or so. Heavy elements are building up until finally, 4.5 billion years ago, we got to the point where we were able to make uh, our sun and form planets around our sun. We think that our sun is one of the first planets in our region of, first suns in our region of the galaxy to be successful in making planets. So we, we kind of got a nice head start on the road to life because our star had a lot of heavy elements in it. That was good. Okay, so now let's draw some lessons from what we've learned here. The first point is that we got here according to well-known laws of physics. I didn't have to invoke any miracles. I needed ripples, density ripples coming out of the Big Bang, but we have a mechanism to make those, and if you ask me in the questions, I'll tell you what we think about them. The moral is, though, that we are subject to the laws of physics and must live within them. We got here about as fast as possible. Either we are very rare and enormously lucky, or life like ours is easy when the conditions are right. Even so, the universe has 14 billion years invested in us. And we should think about that when we contemplate making life uninhabitable in the next 100 years or so, right? A grand cosmic experiment that's been running for 14 billion years is going to get snuffed out. This makes me sad. The solar system might actually be exceedingly rare in having planets that are well separated and are circular on, on circular orbits. That means it's gravitationally stable, and it's going to last with orbits that are rather like they are now for at least another billion years or so. This is an enormous piece of luck, and it seems to set our solar system apart from other solar systems. The sun also has about one billion years of useful life left. So between having a solar system that's stable and a sun that is only middle-aged, we have been given the gift of cosmic time. Time is, we are so lucky, you know. Looking to the future, we have, we're very, very lucky to be here at this stage with so much time left at our disposal. And furthermore, there are other cosmic dangers. Uh, there could be a new, nearby supernova explosion. Turns out that that's very improbable. Or maybe there'll be a comet impact or something like that. I'm assuming that we can solve that problem. We, can, we will learn how to steer objects in the solar system. We already pretty much know how to do it. And the, the energy requirements are not ridiculous. So the moral from all of this is that our cosmic future is bright ahead, and we should contemplate what we're going to do with the next billion years. So this, uh, what, the point I'm trying to make is that if you understand the past, then you can predict the future. So I've just predicted the cosmic future, and it's a bright future that's going to last 100 billion years at least. Okay, so what's going to happen to us now over a billion years? Well, the first thing you notice, uh, this is a plot of world population, and um, it covers uh, maybe 200 years, which is a lot shorter than a billion years. <laughs> so it's very hard to extrapolate our future from the past. We can do that for the universe, but we can't do that for people. You might think 
that maybe population growth would limit our viability on this earth. But people seem to think, no, these are various extrapolations from various sources about how population might grow. This is where we are now. And the extrapolations show some growth, but not enormous growth. We've grown enormously to this point, but probably the growth is tapering off for reasons that you all know, birth control, rising standards of living. And from the standpoint of just uh, not exceeding the ability to grow food on Earth, this is sort of the safe range in recent estimates. So it doesn't look as though we're going to outstrip our ability to grow food. Food isn't the issue. There is another issue, though, and it's best appreciated by looking at longer-term plots of population growth. So here's another plot that goes back in time, and uh, this is proportional to the number of people, and for a while it looks flat, and then suddenly, pow, about 100 years ago it began shooting up. When you see graphs like that, you should think there's better ways to plot them. And instead of making a linear scale that's proportional to the number of people, what you do is you take the logarithm. In other words, each tick here is a factor in growth. Go back to your high school you know, math and remember what a logarithm was. So if we just take exactly the same data as in the previous slide and replot it logarithmically, then it really looks quite different. It looks flat here. It looks kind of linear right around here, and then it begins to shoot up. In other words, there are two points on this graph that look different. There's an inflection point here, and there's another inflection point there. And it turns out that we have explanations for those. This is the Industrial Revolution a couple of hundred years ago. This is when we mastered coal and when we had a lot more energy at our disposal. And it turns out that this inflection point corresponds to the domestication of the horse. And it, it turns out further that these were the two major points in human history when we brought new energy sources under our command. And so the population of the Earth in the past has really been controlled by the amount of energy that we have at our disposal, which is a very, very interesting thing. And so rather than looking at population, we should be focusing on energy. Standard of living is directly tied to energy consumption per person. So this is the real income per person uh, in the 1860s. It's 100, okay? We go back to the Middle Ages here, and here we are today. Look how the standard of living has gone up enormously. It was pretty much flat throughout the Middle Ages, and then it went up with the Industrial Revolution, and of course, that's when we mastered coal. Okay, and... Uh, the U.S. growth in gross domestic product has depended on growing energy consumption. Here are all different kinds of energy, and here is how our, our, uh, the GDP of our country has grown during that period of time. There's a very good correlation. In fact, you can compare the output of different countries with their energy consumption, and there's an excellent correspondence. So I'm really focusing on... on the fact that the limiting factor of future standard of living is likely to be energy, not food. And here is a prediction from some people as to what world energy production is going to look like. And it's going to predict it to peak here around 2050 and then fall, mostly because petroleum is going to get more expensive and harder to find, according to these people. And the problem, of course, is that the demand for energy is going to go up because there are all kinds of people in other countries who would like to have higher standards of living. So the production here, the prediction is that as energy output falls, if it does fall, this is going to cause a great deal of unrest and instability in the world because population isn't falling like that. Okay, so so much for problems caused by not having enough energy. I think, actually, there's a worse problem, and it's caused by CO2. And, of course, you all know that this is related to global warming. So this is a plot of CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And, again, look at this skyrocketing amount here that set in uh, just about 200 years ago. That's when we started to burn coal. I really want to emphasize another moral from astronomy, and that is how small and fragile our atmosphere is. 
you know, 10 miles that way is San Jose. 10 miles that way is outer space, really. I mean, the atmosphere seems big and voluminous and stable, etc., to us small creatures at the bottom of it. But when you go up and look down in a spacecraft like this, you can really see that it's unbelievably thin and therefore a very fragile entity. We should respect this. And for those of people who might doubt that this rise here is due to human factors, I think this graph makes it pretty clear. These years here uh, were before we began to burn coal. This is the amount we can con compute of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere by burning coal. It's this here. So this is what we're doing. Now, I'm not, I don't know enough about atmospheric physics to claim that global warming is occurring, but I think anybody looking at this graph could see that we are messing with the carbon dioxide content. And carbon dioxide is about 30% of the contributor to global warming. So we should be very concerned. Okay, so uh, what is, you might draw a conclusion from this that our current course is not sustainable on cosmic time. Why is that? Supposing we said, actually we're in fine shape now and we'll allow ourselves a factor of two growth over this precious hundred billion years that we want to last. We want to capitalize on that. We want to be here. We don't want to snuff ourselves out. What is the allowable annual growth rate that we're allowed to have if we're allowed to double over two, a uh, factor of two over a billion years? That's the annual growth rate that we're allowed, effectively zero. So the astronomer in me, when I listen to these economic reports and everybody says we have to grow economically to get ourselves out of our economic predicament, my reaction is that's, that's not the way to think about these things. We can't keep doing that. We cannot keep growing the world economy at 3% per year. So, effectively, no increases in resources or population are allowed, and all wastes must be perfectly recycled to levels that can be completely naturally dealt with by the environment. Okay, so you have to put yourself in cosmic sustainability is uh, very far from what um, economic bodies in the world are thinking about today. This is really the moral from astronomy. Okay, so... So now I'm going to wax uh, highly philosophical. Let's imagine our future here, okay? I used to think, well, maybe we would be robots. Maybe our descendants would not be biological. Maybe we'd be making machines and the machines would reproduce. So, in other words, robotic life, will our descendants look like Watson? Remember, Watson was the computer who recently aced these two gentlemen on Jeopardy. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay, that's what Watson looks like. <laughs> right. Hard to get around, but I'm, I'm sure that these intelligent robots would solve that problem. Uh, this is not going to work. And the reason is Watson uses a million more watts per flop than our brains do. So very smart guy, but energy, like an energy hog, Okay. So I really question, it's amazing what biological life has managed to do and how energy efficient it actually is. So I'm not thinking in these terms. I'm thinking in terms of biological life that looks pretty much like us. Okay, so another possibility that comes to my mind is maybe we'll live the way they do in Bhutan. I went to Bhutan once. It's the best trip I ever took. It's an idyllic. It's like Shangri-La. Uh, it's a wonderful country that has, until recently, was pretty much untouched by Western ways. They've lived this way for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. They're healthy, too. It's not a bad life, okay? So, very beautiful place, good agriculture. Here, their kids are adorable, very cute. But there's a problem, okay? This, this is the slogan of their king. Gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. But this whole thing is now falling apart in Bhutan. Bhutan is developing gangs. They couldn't keep television out. It's getting more cars. It's, it's demonstrating that people want novelty. They do not want to live 
boring lives out on the farm. What they want to do is associate with other people. They want to watch bad movies. <laughs> they, they want people want stimulation and the only reason why people are content without stimulation is that they've never had it and they don't know how how nice and fun it is and now the people in Bhutan are finding it out and their society I think within 20 years is going to look like everybody else's okay so how do we put this all together the question I'm asking is what is the kind of future society that you would like to live in Imagine that, you know, 900 million years of those billion years have gone by and you're out there. What do you think that you would need as a human being to be satisfied? Well, first of all, you would demand food, water, housing, health, and education. You would want an opportunity for personal growth and change. And you would want constant newness in the form of new art, knowledge, technology, products, social experiments, and new challenges that are met and surrounded by yourself and by the people around you. I, th I really think this is what I've learned from Bhutan. This may be our undoing. Okay, so let's now try to generate a, a real world based on energy consumption that could meet these requirements. My goal in getting something that's truly sustainable over a billion years is to reduce environmental impact to 1% of its current level. And by that, I mean 1% of our current worldwide energy consumption. Okay, I've taken, I've stressed energy, and I've said that energy is sort of setting the barometer for everything here. To be really safe and conservative and avoid wrecking our world, I'm going to allow that society to consume 1% of current levels. You could argue with this, but let's see what the consequences are. So I'm also assuming that per capita energy use, therefore, sets the limit to the standard of living. And I'm going to assume that we can achieve a factor of two gain in efficiency over what we currently have in California and Europe. I'm conservative there. When I put all this together and do the arithmetic, I get a world with 50 million people in it. Right now we have, I think, six or seven billion people in, in the world today. This world in the future can have only 50 million and that's where we were at the start of the Iron Age about a hundred, uh, about a thousand BC. And of course my test for whether this is a good world and it's a sobering test doesn't look too encouraging actually. How many astronomers in this world? Okay, and it, 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 if, if it's a proportional number to what we have now, there are only 400 astronomers in that world. And that's bad because uh, it's hard to see that we would be doing new science with only 400 people in the field. So this illustrates the fact that the more people you have, the more vibrant the society is going to be, and the more it will be able to generate newness. And with a world of only 50 million people, I'm not sure we can actually do that. That's a challenge. Okay, so I'm finishing here. <laughs> okay, this is a good cartoon. Uh, an inconvenient truth, people would rather go to a reassuring lie. I, the astronomer, look at all of this and I say, this is a reassuring lie. This is what really is going on. You may, you may uh, uh, content yourself and think you're doing the right thing, being wise, forward-looking, and so on, by adopting an inconvenient truth, over here is cosmic reality, which is even more strict and stringent. We've got to think about that. Thank you.